ನಮಸ್ತೆ ಸ್ನೇಹಿತರೆ ಬೆಂಗಳೂರು ಹಿಸ್ಟೋರಿಯನ್ ಸೊಸೈಟಿ ಇತಿಹಾಸ ದರ್ಪಣ ಹಾಗೂ ಋತುಮಾನ ಡಾಟ್ ಕಾಮ್ ಸಂಯುಕ್ತ ಆಶ್ರಯದಲ್ಲಿ ನಡೀತಾ ಇರತಕ್ಕಂತಹ ಅರಿವಿನ ನೀರಿಗೆ ಉಪನ್ಯಾಸ ಸರಣಿಯ ಇಪ್ಪತ್ತೆರಡನೆಯ ಉಪನ್ಯಾಸ ಕಾರ್ಯಕ್ರಮಕ್ಕೆ ತಮ್ಗೆಲ್ಲರಿಗೂ ಕೂಡ ಹಾರ್ದಿಕವಾದ ಸ್ವಾಗತ ಇವತ್ತು ನಮ್ಮ ನಡುವೆ ಇದ್ದಾರೆ ಡಾಕ್ಟರ್ ಗಿಲ್ ಬೆನ್ ಹೇರತ್ ಅವರು ಅವರು ಸೌತ್ ಫ್ಲೋರಿಡಾ ಯೂನಿವರ್ಸಿಟಿಯಲ್ಲಿ ರಿಲಿಜಿಯಸ್ ಸ್ಟಡೀಸ್ ವಿಭಾಗದಲ್ಲಿ ಅಸೋಸಿಯೇಟ್ ಪ್ರೊಫೆಸರ್ ಆಗಿ ಕೆಲಸ ಮಾಡ್ತಾ ಇದ್ದಾರೆ ಎರಡ್ ಸಾವಿರದ ನಾಲ್ಕರಲ್ಲಿ ತಮ್ಮ ಬಿ ಎ ಪದವಿಯನ್ನ ಟೆಲ್ ಅಬೀವ್ ಯೂನಿವರ್ಸಿಟಿ ಇಸ್ರೇಲ್ ನಲ್ಲಿ ಅವರು ಪೂರೈಸ್ತಾರೆ ಎರಡ್ ಸಾವಿರದ ಏಳರಲ್ಲಿ ತಮ್ಮ ಎಂ ಎ ಪದವಿಯನ್ನ ಟೆಲ್ ಅಬೀವ್ ಯೂನಿವರ್ಸಿಟಿಲಿ ಈ ರೆಸರ್ಟೇಷನ್ ಅಥವಾ ಪ್ರಬಂಧದ ಮೂಲಕ ಪೂರೈಸ್ತಾರೆ ಅದೇನಂದ್ರೆ ದ ಡಿಸೆಂಟ್ ಆಫ್ ಗಾಡೆಸ್ ಗಂಗಾ ಎ ಟ್ರಾನ್ಸ್ಲೇಷನ್ ಆಫ್ ಎ ಮಹಾಕಾವ್ಯ ಪೋಯಂ ಫ್ರಮ್ ಸಂಸ್ಕೃತ್ ಇನ್ ಟು ಹೀಬ್ರೂ ಅಂಡ್ ರಿಸರ್ಚ್ ರಿಸರ್ಚ್ ಆನ್ ಪೊಲಿಟಿಕಲ್ ಹಿಸ್ಟೋರಿಕಲ್ ಅಂಡ್ ರಿಲಿಜಿಯಸ್ ಬ್ಯಾಕ್ ಗ್ರೌಂಡ್ ಇದರ ಮಾರ್ಗದರ್ಶಕರು ಇಸ್ರೇಲಿನ ವಿದ್ವಾಂಸ ಯೊಹಾನನ್ ಗ್ರಿನ್ ಶ್ಪಾನ್ ಅವರು ಎರಡ್ ಸಾವಿರದ ಹದಿಮೂರರಲ್ಲಿ ತಮ್ಮ ಪಿ ಎಚ್ ಡಿ ಪದವಿಯನ್ನ ಎಮೋರ್ ಯೂನಿವರ್ಸಿಟಿಯಿಂದ ಅವರು ಪಡಿತಾರೆ ತಮ್ಮ ಪಿ ಎಚ್ ಡಿ ಪದವಿಯನ್ನ ನರೇಟಿಂಗ್ ಡಿಮೋಷನ್ ರೆಪ್ರೆಸೆಂಟೇಷನ್ ಅಂಡ್ ಪ್ರಿಸ್ಕ್ರಿಪ್ಷನ್ ಆಫ್ ದಿ ಅರ್ಲಿ ಕನ್ನಡ ಶಿವಭಕ್ತಿ ಟ್ರೆಡಿಷನ್ಸ್ ಅಕಾರ್ಡಿಂಗ್ ಟು ಹರಿಹರಾಸ್ ಶಿವಶರಣೆಯರ ರಗಳೆಗಳು ಅನ್ನೋ ವಿಷಯದ ಮೇಲೆ ಮಾಡ್ತಾರೆ ಕನ್ನಡದ ವಿದ್ವಾಂಸ ಆರ್ ವಿ ಎಸ್ ಸುಂದರಮ್ ಅವರು ಈ ಪಿ ಎಚ್ ಡಿ ಪ್ರಬಂಧದ ಚೇರ್ ನಲ್ಲಿ ಇರ್ತಾರೆ ಎರಡ್ ಸಾವಿರದ ಹದಿಮೂರಿಂದ ಎರಡ್ ಸಾವಿರದ ಹತ್ತೊಂಬತ್ತರವರೆಗೆ ಗಿಲ್ ಬೆನ್ ಹೇರತ್ ಅವರು ಫ್ಲೋರಿಡಾ ಸೌತ್ ಯೂನಿವರ್ಸಿಟಿಯಲ್ಲಿ ರಿಲಿಜಿಯಸ್ ಸ್ಟಡೀಸ್ ವಿಭಾಗದಲ್ಲಿ ಅಸಿಸ್ಟೆಂಟ್ ಪ್ರೊಫೆಸರ್ ಆಗಿ ಎರಡ್ ಸಾವಿರದ ಹತ್ತೊಂಬತ್ತರಿಂದ ಇಲ್ಲಿವರೆಗೂ ಕೂಡ ಅಲ್ಲಿಯೇ ಅಸೋಸಿಯೇಟ್ ಪ್ರೊಫೆಸರ್ ಆಗಿ ತಮ್ಮ ಕಾರ್ಯವನ್ನ ನಿರ್ವಹಿಸ್ತಾ ಇದ್ದಾರೆ ಇವರ ಪ್ರಮುಖವಾದ ಅಧ್ಯಯನ ಮತ್ತು ಅಧ್ಯಾಪನ ಆಸಕ್ತಿಗಳು ಹೀಗಿದೆ ಒಂದು ಸೌತ್ ಏಷಿಯನ್ ಡಿ ಡಿವೋಷನಲ್ ಟ್ರೆಡಿಷನ್ಸ್ ಪ್ರಿ ಮಾಡರ್ನ್ ರಿಲಿಜಿಯಸ್ ಲಿಟ್ರೇಚರ್ ಇನ್ ಕನ್ನಡ ಹಿಂದೂ ನರೇಟಿವ್ ಟ್ರೆಡಿಷನ್ಸ್ ಮತ್ತು ಸೈಂಟ್ ಹುಡ್ ಅಂಡ್ ಹೆಜಿಯೋಗ್ರಫಿ ಇವರ ಬಹುಮುಖ್ಯವಾದ ಕೃತಿಗಳು ಹೀಗಿದೆ ಎರಡ್ ಸಾವಿರದ ಹದಿನೆಂಟರಲ್ಲಿ ತಮ್ಮ ಪಿ ಎಚ್ ಡಿ ಪದವಿಯನ್ನೇ ಅವರು ಪರಿಷ್ಕರಿಸಿ ಶಿವಾಸ್ ಸೈಂಟ್ಸ್ ದಿ ಒರಿಜಿನ್ಸ್ ಆಫ್ ಡಿವೋಷನ್ ಇನ್ ಕನ್ನಡ ಅಕಾರ್ಡಿಂಗ್ ಟು ಹರಿಹರಾಸ ರಗಳೆಗಳು ಅನ್ನುವ ಕೃತಿಯನ್ನ ಪ್ರಕಟಿಸ್ತಾರೆ ನ್ಯೂಯಾರ್ಕ್ ನ ಆಕ್ಸ್ಫರ್ಡ್ ಯೂನಿವರ್ಸಿಟಿ ಪ್ರೆಸ್ ಈ ಕೃತಿಯನ್ನ ಪಬ್ಲಿಷ್ ಮಾಡಿದೆ ಇವರಿಗೆ ಸಂದಿರತಕ್ಕಂಥ ಪ್ರಶಸ್ತಿಗಳ ಬಗ್ಗೆ ನಾನು ಗಮನ ಹರಿಸಬೇಕು ಎರಡ್ ಸಾವಿರದ ಹತ್ತೊಂಬತ್ತರಲ್ಲಿ ಎರಡ್ ಇವರಿಗೆ ಬೆಸ್ಟ್ ಫಸ್ಟ್ ಬುಕ್ ಅವಾರ್ಡ್ ಅನ್ನುವ ಪ್ರಶಸ್ತಿಯನ್ನ ಸೌತ್ ಈಸ್ಟರ್ನ್ ಮಿಡಿವಲ್ ಅಸೋಸಿಯೇಷನ್ ಅಥವಾ ಸೆಮಾ ಅಂತಕ್ಕಂಥ ಅಮೆರಿಕದ ಒಂದು ಅಸೋಸಿಯೇಷನ್ ನೀಡಿದೆ ಎರಡ್ ಸಾವಿರದ ಇಪ್ಪತ್ತರಲ್ಲಿ ಬೆಸ್ಟ್ ಬುಕ್ ಅವಾರ್ಡ್ ಅನ್ನ ಸೌತ್ ಈಸ್ಟರ್ನ್ ಕಾನ್ಫರೆನ್ಸ್ ಆಫ್ ದಿ ಅಸೋಸಿಯೇಷನ್ ಫಾರ್ ಏಷಿಯನ್ ಸ್ಟಡೀಸ್ ಎಸ್ ಸಿ ಸಿ ಅಥವಾ ಎಎಸ್ ಎ ಎ ಎಸ್ ಅಂತಕ್ಕಂಥ ಅಮೆರಿಕದ ಇನ್ನೊಂದು ಸಂಸ್ಥೆಯಿಂದ ಇವರಿಗೆ ನೀಡಲ್ಪಟ್ಟಿದೆ ಸರಿಸುಮಾರು ಐವತ್ತಕ್ಕೂ ಹೆಚ್ಚು ಪ್ರಬಂಧಗಳನ್ನ ಗಿಲ್ ಬೆನ್ ಹೇರತ್ ಅವರು ರಟ್ಲೆಜ್ ಟ್ರಾನ್ಸ್ಲೇಷನ್ ಸ್ಟಡೀಸ್ ಇನ್ ಇಸ್ರೇಲ್ ಇಂಟರ್ನ್ಯಾಷನಲ್ ಜರ್ನಲ್ ಆಫ್ ಹಿಂದೂ ಸ್ಟಡೀಸ್ ಜರ್ನಲ್ ಆಫ್ ಹಿಂದೂ ಸ್ಟಡೀಸ್ ರಿಲಿಜನ್ಸ್ ಆಫ್ ಸೌತ್ ಏಷಿಯಾ ಮುಂತಾದ ಅನೇಕ ಜರ್ನಲ್ಗಳಲ್ಲಿ ನಿಯತಕಾಲಿಕೆಗಳಲ್ಲಿ ಪ್ರಕಾಶನ ಮಾಡಿದ್ದಾರೆ ಸೊ ಅಂತಹ ಗಿಲ್ ಬೆನ್ ಹೇರತ್ ಅವರು ವಿಶೇಷವಾಗಿ ರಗಳೆಗಳು ಮತ್ತು ವಚನಗಳನ್ನ ಮುಖಾಮುಖಿ ಇಟ್ಕೊಂಡು ತಮ್ಮ ಥೀಸಿಸ್ ಅನ್ನು ಮಾಡಿದವರು ಸೊ ಅದೇ ವಿಷಯದ ಮೇಲೆ ಇವತ್ತು ನಮ್ಮನ್ನು ಉದ್ದೇಶಿಸಿ ಮಾತನಾಡಲಿಕ್ಕೆ ಇದ್ದಾರೆ ಅಂತಹ ಗಿಲ್ ಬೆನ್ ಹೇರತ್ ಅವರಿಗೆ ಬೆಂಗಳೂರು ಹಿಸ್ಟೋರಿಯನ್ ಸೊಸೈಟಿ ಇತಿಹಾಸ ದರ್ಪಣ ಹಾಗೂ ಋತುಮಾನ ಡಾಂಕ ಮತ್ತು ಈ
to the research I'm doing today. So kind of just serving, excuse me, serving the work that I did until now and presenting different elements of, of that research, all kinds of different components. The second part of my lecture will be more uh, kind of organized and I'm going to read it from paper, from electronic paper. Um, and that is the new research that I'm focusing on, which is the, what I call the early testimonies um, for Vachanas. And uh, so that part, I'm going to read it. It's going to be more organized and focused. Um, but I really wanted to give some background of my work and study. So let's, uh, let's start with the, the first part of my presentation. We are, uh, we're going to try and turn on uh, my screen so I can share with you. So please give me a moment uh, and let's see if we can do this. <clears throat> so I'm sharing my screen. Um, I think that's a good way of doing this. Okay, uh, I need someone, Pradeep, could you um, just confirm that you're seeing my screen? Yes, 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 it's visible. Okay, great, great. Okay, so <clears throat> early testimonies for Vachanas in Canada literature. And um, okay, um, <clears throat> this is the book that Pradeep mentioned. Uh, but so let me just give a brief background of me. I think Pradeep already described to you how I came from Israel, BA Masters. Um, <clears throat> but Israel, Israel is also a travel a lot in India. And I was one of those young early backpackers. And I traveled a lot in India in different places. But some, something drew me first to Hampi and all the wonderful places of Karnataka. Eventually for my PhD work, I chose to study, to learn Kannada and to work on uh, all, all, the, all the literature of Kannada, which is basically, for most of it is unknown in the academy. Um, I, I did some work in, on Sanskrit with H.V. Nagarajarao, who lives in Mysore. So I kind of, you know, I fell for Mysore. Uh, this beautiful place and 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 the people of Mysore and the people of Bangalore and other areas of Karnataka. So all of that kind of led me to develop my research. And um, I published a book like you I'm going to describe in a second. <clears throat> and now I serve as an associate professor at USF. Uh, so kind of in general, my work focuses on the literature and the history as we remember the history of the 12th century Shaiva devotees in the Kannada speaking regions, which we know today as the you know, Shiva Sharanas and the kind of the progenitors of Vira Shaivism, Lingayat and so on. Um, all my research work, um, which already started, I think about 15 years ago, um, kind of led to the publication of this book that you're seeing now on the screen. It's called Shiva's Saints, the origins of devotion in Kannada according to and what kind of um, prompted me to read Harihara was basically a discovery that we have this very early text, right, from the early decades of the 13th century, the first literature, the first written work about the Shiva Sharanas, and very close to, to the events that happened. I mean, I don't know, maybe 50 years, 70 years after Basavana and uh, Alama Prabhu and all the other people, all the other saints were walking in North Karnataka, Harihara sat down and wrote their life stories, which I thought was peculiar. And uh, so I sat down and read them when, with the help of a lot of uh, Karnadiga scholars. And I kind of reached to this moment of understanding that the way that Harihara describes their lives is not, uh, is not definitely not identical to the way that we are thinking about the early saints today. Um, <clears throat> so my book presents a close reading of, uh, of this seminal collection of saints life stories from the early 13th century. And in the book, I challenge the inherited conceptions about the early Shiva devotion uh, tradition in the Canada speaking regions. I'm arguing that the local culture of devotion was far more inclusive and diverse than its later configurations. And I think throughout my talk today, this question of 
wait a minute, those materials open up new ways of, of thinking about bhakti in Canada, new approaches in ways that we usually don't think about Shiva Bhakti in the Canada region. Uh, I think that that response might come back in uh, during my lecture. <coughs> um, so the book came up, came out. I'm sorry, in 2018, it got some nice reviews and and awards, uh, and it it in a very natural way almost it led to my next project, which is a co-translation of the stories into English. Uh, I'm saying co-translation because the part of RVS Sundaram, the the this collaboration, this event could not happen, could not have happened without RVS Sundaram, uh, who is in Mysore and just a wonderful, wonderful scholar. And we together embarked on this journey, which we are now very close to finish. So we're very close to finish and publish uh, what I kind of tenta tentatively call stories of Shiva's saints. Um, if my book right now makes arguments and refers to Harihara's stories, but I wanted to provide to the audience the stories themselves uh, because of their historical importance, but also because Harihara, I find him to be an incredible poet, an author, and a storyteller. Beautifully organized stories. So we picked 18 stories. He wrote many ragales, many stories. Most of them are dedicated to lives of saints. Some of the stories are about different aspects of Shiva Bhakti, like worship. Um, but he talks about many Tamil saints or Sanskrit, famous Sanskrit poets, Kalidasa or Banna, Bana. Uh, so we selected 18 stories out of the Ragale, of the collection of Ragale stories by Harihara, 18 stories which are limited or specific about Kannada figures. That is saints that their lives and their miracles and their actions were located in the Kannada region because I think that's the most unfamiliar part of Shaivism in South India. We just don't have translations of these stories. There are few ex exceptions. There is a beautiful book, uh, a beautiful translation by H. Uh, I'm sorry, by uh, Narayana Rao and Vilcharu Narayana Rao uh, and, uh, and H. Roghair from Telugu, uh, a book called Shiva's Warriors, which captures a very important text in relation to Harihara, which is Palkuriki Somanata's um, Basava Puranamu in Telugu, composed not long after. But this is really the exception. There are not many translations of these stories and these figures, which are so interesting. Bhogana or Adaya or Yekanta Ramaya and so on. I'm, I'm providing here the list of the specific stories that we um, chose to translate. I wanted before, again, before I'm going to start my talk, I just wanted to present because this is work in progress or actually very close to finishing. We're very close to finishing the book, writing the introduction, sending out to the publisher. Um, so I'm going to read to you just these two pages from the translation that we did. Um, <clears throat> so uh, this is the opening of uh, the Ragale about Allama Prabhu. Uh, the story of Allama Prabhu. Um, and it begins with kind of a Mangala shloka or, you know, um, in the lotus hearts of various saints, Lord Shiva dwells. He who is served by all the gods and is dark of throat, ponders with affection, Allama the celestial. This is three-eyed Shiva of Hampi. In, and then the story begins. In Kailasa Mountain, three-eyed Shiva of Hampi, ocean of fortune, adored by all his auspicious attendants, happily joined his royal assembly. As he sat, one of the saintly beings, Nirmaya the undeceived, entered. This saintly being cast his gaze upon one of the divine damsels 
with a look of longing. And Hara, perceiving this, said to the two of them with utmost compassion, leave this place, both of you, be born on earth and take pleasure in all carnal enjoyments decreed by the God of love, but linger not in the enjoyment, return here promptly. Delighted by Hara's command, both joyfully descended to the world of humans. And now we're switching the translation into a structure which is more poetic. <clears throat> Considered a jewel on earth, enthralling to the minds of the community of saints, shining with well-laid and newly built streets, splendid in its beautiful layout, dedicated to three-eyed Shiva peopled by those living on Hara's consecrated food and the sacred water that washed his feet, sustained by the wealth of the city's saints of Hara, known as the issue of true devotion to Shiva, the beloved abode of the one who is the root of existence and his place of rest, generating delight as the best of cities. <clears throat> this city was known as Bari Gavi, the city of vines, and it glimmered with multitudes of saints, like young saplings sprouting forth from the earth. Nirmaya, to undergo birth, entered the womb of the wife of a gracious leader called Naga Vasadipati, who was the chief of one of the city's quarters. When she conceived, marks of her pregnancy were manifest both within and without her body. Literally, uh, oh, this is not part of the translation. It should not be here. Okay, so I, I will end the reading here. It continues on and on, descriptions of her pregnancy, the birth of Nirmaya as Alama Prabhu, and of course, Alama Prabhu's uh, life story. So this is a project, the translations of the Ragalegalu, and I'm not going to say much more about it now, although there is a lot to say, um, and maybe it will come up again in the question and answers. I hope uh, we'll get a chance to touch on that as well. Uh, but now I want to turn <clears throat> to another side project that came from this translation. Because when I started translating with uh, Meshtru Arviya Sundaram, uh, very quickly I kind of I hit a brick wall. I needed the Kittel Dictionary, which some of you probably know is very large dictionary and other dictionaries. None of them is available online. There are some good dictionaries online. I encourage you to look for Allah, uh, which is wonderful. But um, Kittel does provide a kind of a, um, um, it includes the old registers of Canada language in the dictionary. It was very much essential for a project and I just didn't have it available online. So what I did was uh, write this computer, this computer program to make Kittel available online. And this brought another side project that I have, but I wanted to present it to, to you, to the audience, most of you um, Kannadigas, um, the online edition to the Canada, to the Kittel Canada English Dictionary. Uh, the project name is Digital Roses. Oops, I'm sorry, just a sec. <clears throat> I'm going to open the website right now. So this is a website that um, <coughs> that I developed together with my partner for this project, Chris Handy. We call the project Digital Roses, and it basically it allows browsing print dictionaries in any language. It started with Kittle. Um, if you let me just show you again. If you go here to this URL https canada.digitalroses.net you will reach to this page which basically has two dictionaries or two editions of Kittle. The first one is the uh, original publication from 1894. The second one is uh, a kind of a large and developed edition by the Madras University in four volumes and Basically how this works is that you can look up a word, you can type in Canada keyboard. I'm not going to type in Canada keyboard right now. I'm going to use the uh, transliteration of English, but you know, just to use a word like karma and you click search, 
and you immediately find the right page of Kittel. So it's a very good, uh, it's a very comfortable way of um, browsing a dictionary. So here, Karma, and you can see Karma in the Kittel 4 volume edition next to it. But it's a very quick and easy way to browse dictionaries online, even though they're not digitized. And I would be happy to talk more about this project, which again, it's kind of a side project to what I do, but it allows, it opens up I mean, if we try and if we can think about different dictionaries, lexicons of Canada literature in the past and in the present, um, all of them can be digitized very easily. So I encourage anyone who's interested to learn more about this project and maybe contribute to it. Uh, I'd be happy to talk more. I can show you here. So digitalroses.net, rapid online search engine for scans. That is roses roses. Okay. Um, but because <clears throat> today we are we're focusing on um, on something else, which is the uh, the Vachanas, the Vachanas, I'm going to uh, kind of put aside all these side projects, again, the translation and this and, 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 and each one of them is, is uh, interesting to talk um, separately, but but I want to give them major space of today to uh, to the, the to this issue of the uh, of the vachanas it's a project that i call a history of speaking <coughs> a history of speaking is it's 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 a translation speaking is, is one way of translating vachana so um, this project um, i'm talking about today is a history of vachanas and uh, now I'm going to switch to the written text and, and read more, um, but we'll show you the slides together with that. So my talk today is a part of a new project in which I trace the history of devotional poetry in Canada called Vachanas from the early 12th century to the modern period. As I intend to show, the transmission and reception of the Vachanas during the last eight centuries was far uh, was far from being monolithic or linear. And I wish to present today this work in progress as a reflection on how we think and study religious literature in historical context, rather than as inherited wisdom. <clears throat> My talk will move backward in time rather than forward. I shall begin with charting contemporary interpretations of the 12th century Vachanas then pay attention to the Vijayanagara period of the 15th and 16th centuries, which was a seminal moment in the Vachana's reception. And finally, turn to examine the earliest written traces of the Vachanas from the early 13th century. Like many foundational narratives, the one I begin my talk with today is deceptively simple. It tells about Shaiva devotees in the Western Deccan of the 12th century who came together in order to fight social in inequity. According to the inherited narrative, these intentions were translated into action through the formation of an egalitarian devotional community in North Karnataka, in a town called Kalyana during the twilight of the Chalukya Empire. The charismatic leader of the community, a figure named Basavanna, was initially favored by the ruler, King Bijala II, but the uncompromising vision of an egalitarian community culminated in catastrophe. The king, incited by conservative Brahmins who opposed the egalitarian message of the Shaivas, attacked the community and dispersed it. Retaliation soon followed, with two devotees murdering King Bijala and the ensuing collapse of Kalyana. The surviving Shaiva devotees spread across the Deccan and elsewhere. In the course of the subsequent eight centuries, they managed to maintain their unique identity under two labels, Vira Shaivas and Lingayats, and today have grown to become a powerful amalgam of religious communities in Karnataka and elsewhere, with a thriving network of religious institutions, martas, educational organizations, and political associations. The 12th century community not only lived according to their bold social and religious vision, but also expressed it in devotional poetry that became, in the centuries to come, their most enduring legacy. 
And I'm talking, of course, about the Vajana. As with other devotional traditions in South Asia, from the Tamil South of the late first millennium to the early modern Hindi belt, the ethos of devotional life cannot be separated from the central medium of devotional songs. In the case of this tradition, the songs were called vachanas, with the word vachana sometimes translated as utterance or speaking. The two pictures <clears throat> we are looking at here, which are essentially the same, depict the hall of experience or Anubhava Mantapa, an open public space in which devotees challenged and inspired each other by spontaneously composing vachanas. This image is among the most familiar icons of the tradition as it captures the vibrancy of this devotional collective. The narrative I've just presented has been known in the West since at least the middle of the 19th century, beginning with the work of C.P. Brown. It also received the attention of luminaries such as Max Weber, but its current hold in the Western classroom is mostly the result of A.K. Ramanujan's book from 1973, speaking of Shiva. In the introduction to his book, Ramanujan unravels the radical ideas communicated in the Vachanas and analyzes their unconventional poetics. The text includes a selection of vachanas masterfully translated into English by Ramanujan to present the progressive attitudes of the tradition, some of which bring to mind modern values, such as individual freedom and modern epistems regarding social upliftment and personal devotion. Again, I apologize for being less than 100% healthy today. <coughs> the following is a famous vachana attributed to the charismatic leader of the 12th century community, Basavana. Uh, I mean, with you as audiences here, there is a, there is a lot of uh, sense in reading in Canada as well. I'll do it just once, maybe just. So, Ullavaru uh, Chivalaya Marida Mariharu. Nan yena maduve, badavana ya yena kale kamba, de have de gula, shira hona kala shavaya, kudara sangamadeva kelaya, stavara kalivuntu, jangama kalivilla. So the famous translation by Ramanujan the rich will make temples for Shiva. What shall I, a poor man, do? My legs are pillars, the body the shrine, the head a cupola of gold. Listen, O Lord of the meeting rivers, things standing shall fall, but the moving ever shall stay. This short vachana demonstrates the lyrical quality and bold messages that are, that are regularly attributed to vachana poetry. And we can easily see how the personal voice articulated here resonates deeply with the sensibilities of the modern and progressive individual. Ramanujan's extraordinary poetic sensibilities contribute to the phenomenal, phenomenal success of his book and led to Veera Shaivism having a permanent place in classrooms where Hinduism and Bhakti are studied. And this is very true until today, uh, more almost 40 years after he published this book. What informs my talk, however, is a larger debate about the textual origins of the Vachanas whether they were composed in the 12th century or rather recreated by the later tradition. And why, when, what might this tell us about the history of this devotional tradition? In order to understand this debate, we need to take a deeper look into the modern discourse of Vachanas in the state of Karnataka, which mostly unfolds in Canada. Within Canada circles, Ramanujan was a notable representative of a far broader project of reinscribing the Vachanas and their composers of the 12th century as important precursors to modern India. The renewed interest in the Vachanas, which in the 19th century had little hold in the public sphere of the region, came from public figures who started to enlist the poems in the cause of realigning contemporary Indian society according to Western values, 
of rationality, education, social equity, and personal faith. A key figure in this history is Fagu Harakarti, a scholar, legal expert, educator, publisher, and reformist, Halakati wished to uplift the Lingayat communities <coughs> by realigning them, not only with conservative Hindu traditions, but also in accord with rationalist and nationalist expectations. He believed that the Vajanas could become a powerful medium in promoting social change. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> In painstaking archival excavations in libraries of the martyrs of North Karnataka during the first decades of the 20th century, Halakati collected hundreds of manuscripts of Vajanas that he then edited and had published in multiple venues. The scholar Vijay Kumar Boratti described Halakati's project as, and I'm quoting, converting medieval vachanas into an, a universalist body of humanist tales, as well as a native unparalleled community literature. Halakarti employed selective editing of vachanas and sometimes also changed their language in the process. Within Virashaiva circles, there were some who rejected Halakati's insistence on the primacy of vachanas and questioned their authenticity and value for the community. In 1922, Vachanas, which Halakati translated to English, were published in the Indian Antiquary, and the journal's editor, Sir Richard, Richard Temple, made the following observation in the introduction, and I'm quoting him. The question whether these Vachanas are actually the work of Basava or not has never been settled, and certain, certainly can scarcely be attained until all the utterances attributed to him have been critically examined from the point of view of language as well as history. Temple's careful questioning of the Vachana's authenticity reflected more intense debates, both within and outside the Virashaiva communities, debates that are still ongoing. But despite these doubts and this resistance, looking back from today, it is clear that Halakati's project of discovering or rediscovering the Vachanas in the early 20th century was highly successful and played a critical role in fueling the growth of a language-based nationalistic ethos in Karnataka during the second half of the 20th century. The image here shows the 108 foot statue of Basavana that was erected outside Kalyana, the name of which was changed in 1967, as most of you know, on <clears throat> the eighth centenary of Basavana to Basava Kalyana. Since 2004, with the establishment of the Basava Kalyana Development Authority, new monuments and landmarks commemorating events from the 12th century have been changing the physical landscape in and around Kalyana or Basava Kalyana. The modern discourse on the Vachanas played a major role in all of this, with quotations from Vachanas physically etched in the monuments of a network of holy sites. But debates over the Vachanas' textual authenticity and meaning persist. Part of the difficulty lies in the absence of literary conventions or fixed meter and structure that would help define this fluid genre and its ever-growing canon. Therefore, a formal textual definition of Vachanas is limited, to say the least. <coughs> Vachanas are usually short and contain a single message spoken to the god Shiva. The specific name of Shiva serves as the poet's signature, or Ankita, which usually comes at the last line of the poem. These minimal features can render almost any lyrical utterance as vachana. Another famous vachana attributed to Basavana openly rejects the possibility of fixing vachanas, the, the, the poems themselves, in a formal structure or according, or according to poetic conventions. 
So uh, from now on, just for the sake of time, I'm going to stick to the English translations. Please excuse me. Vachanas are beautiful, especially in Canada. So I don't know anything like time beats and meter, nor the arithmetic of strings and drums. I don't know the count of I am and dactyl. My Lord of Meeting Rivers, as nothing will hurt you, I'll sing as I love. In this vachana, the absence of poetic structure is self-consciously linked to legitimizing spontaneous devotional expression by the uneducated and was read by Ramanujan and others as a testimony to the egalitarian ethos of the tradition, even though Basamana himself was known as an educated Brahmin. Be, uh, beyond open questions about the Vachana's poetic form, the meanings and agendas assigned to the Vachanas are be bewilderingly diverse. Different agents with different stakes in the socio-political milieu of Karnataka have claimed the Vachanas as theirs, or at least passed judgment on their significance. These agents include the Virashava Lingaita religious communities, some of which treat the Vachanas is holy scripture. Dalit groups and social activists who see the Vachanas as promulgating social egalitarianism, and Kannada literati who see them as precursors to modern poetry, and in post independent India as the fulcrum of national identity and a watershed in the region's cultural history. To paraphrase a famous metaphor coined by Ramanujan on another subject, the Vachanas, instead of windows to the world in which they were created, often serves as mirrors for those who invoke them. Furthermore, with political and economic interest at stake, it is not surprising that debates about the Vachanas are relentless and sometimes lead to communal and religious conflicts, protests, and even acts of violence. Scholarship on the Vachanas has been equally polyphonic, contested, and often uncritical and partial. For example, the compelling Vachana translations of Ramanujan present the 12th century community as progressive and universal, but this liberal vision is very much the result of ignoring other Vachanas that promote traditional values or intercommunal hatred. Other scholars, such as Jan Schotten and Lila Mulati, have been quick to use Vachanas as historical evidence for a democratic and egalitarian society <clears throat> in the 12th century without considering the historical sources of these Vachanas. In response to this, some scholars have rejected the possibility of interpreting Vachanas historically by pointing to their complicated reception in history, the absence of clear textual features they could be identified by, and the bewildering diversity of voices and stances found in them. In 1997, Robert Zeidenboss criticized Schotten's reliance on Vachanas to reconstruct the early history of the Virashaivas. Zeidenboss wrote, <coughs> and I'm, I'm quoting him, <clears throat> to write that Virashaivism has been democratic, feminist, or egalitarian from the beginning, as some modern writers do, is somewhat like writing that nuclear weapons were used in the Ramayana, as some other authors do. More recently, scholars have also begun to question whether Vachanas existed at all in the early period. The doubting of, Vachana, of the Vachanas' historical authenticity and the possibility of a fabricated tradition are rooted in how vachanas were transmitted throughout the ages. As I mentioned earlier, the word vachana can mean extemporaneous expression. And indeed, it appears that the first centuries after their appearance, the vachanas were mostly transmitted orally or in manuscripts that are now lost to us. There are no poetic treatises or literary anthologies that mention or include vachanas until the 15th century. To the best of our knowledge, it was only at this late moment that vachanas were systematically collected and edited. The first written collection of vachanas 
was a Kotara Shetastala, produced around 1425, and it was soon followed by other compilations and, render and renditions. These editions were characterized by a thorough systemization of the Vachanas. In some of them, Vachanas were organized into groups according to philosophical categories, the Shagstalas, that did not appear in the body of the poems. In others, dramatic new scenes were added before and after Vachanas in order to explain the context in which they were composed. As I and others have argued, the new motivation in the 15th century to codify and canonize the Vachanas was tied to the interests and anxieties of religious institutions and monastic orders at the Vijayanagara court. The 12th century Vachanas and the saintly poets who composed them provided for these agents a necessary mythical foundation, one which was reconfigured according to contemporary needs, such as a new emphasis on renunciation, monastic institutions, and fixed communal identity. The memory of the 12th century Vachana composers was as malleable as the Vachanas attributed to them. I began my talk with this slide and the narrative about the Kalyana Fellowship. We can see here a crowd of Shaiva devotees that surrounds three key figures who are engaged in conversation. All three are renowned and prolific Vachana composers. Vasavana, Allama Prabhu and Akka Mahadevi in the remainder of my talk today, I will focus on these figures and investigate how they and their vachanas were portrayed in the early hagiographies of the tradition before they were reconfigured in the Vijayanagara period. This image depicts an incident that appears for the first time in the fourth edition of the Shunya Sampadane from the early 16th century. The incident represents an important moment in the tradition's remembered history when Akamaha Devi arrives in Kalyana and meets Basavana, Allama Prabhu, and their associates. Mahadevi had just walked out of her marriage to a non Shaiva with only the locks of her hair to cover her naked body, seeking to unite with her true lover, the god Shiva. Here, we see her subsequent arrival in Kalyana and meeting with the fellowship of devotees at the Hall of Experience, where she is being scrutinized by Alama Prabhu, the spiritual leader of the devotional community in a dialogue constructed of Vajanas. Mahadevi's visit to Kalyana is so deeply rooted in the region's public memory that a visitor to Basava Kalyana today can walk into the Anubhava Mantapa and even find caves with specific signs that indicate where Mahadevi meditated. But as I mentioned earlier, this concrete physical memory of Mahadevi in Kalyana relies on a narrative that developed very late in the 16th century. Earlier accounts about Mahadevi say nothing about her arrival in Kalyana and instead describe Mahadevi <clears throat> going straight to Sri Shailam after leaving her marriage. I'm not concerned here with historical claims about the whereabouts of Mahadevi, whether she actually visited this place or that place. Rather, I wish to turn our attention to the fact that the custodians of the Vira Shaiva past in the Vijayanagara period felt compelled to bring Mahadevi to Kalyana and reimagine the traditions for genitors together in Kalyana. In other words, the editors were not obligated to previous written accounts and did not hesitate to present a different storyline and a different history. In a similar fashion, vachanas were heavily reworked during this period. For example, the four versions of the Shunya Sampadane, which appeared over a period of 90 years, are dramatically different from each other in terms of which vachanas are quoted in them. The star staggering number of vachanas that appear in only one of these four versions and not in the others is 793. In other words, if we count vachanas that appear just in one edition 
and not in the three others of the Shune Sampadane, we reach almost 800. One might ask, which among these vachanas is original and which is a later edition? And how can we tell? The realization that in fact, we know very little about the vachanas before the Vijayanagara period opens up a new space for thinking about their textuality, their transmission, their dissemination and their reception during the early stages of the tradition. <clears throat> which vachanas were actually composed in the 12th century and which were added later. In light of their lack of structure and complicated textual transmission, it is, in, even, is it even possible to authenticate vachanas? Broader questions ensue. Will the historicizing of the vachanas transmission reveal changes in devotional trends over time? What might a context specific textual investigation of the vachanas tell us about the history of the tradition? And what is the task and significance of studying a text history in a religious tradition that is living and growing, a tradition in which, as many times is the case in India, saints are more than just historical figures. They serve as symbols of a broad set of concerns and issues over time. In recent years, scholars of devotional traditions have started to pay notice to these questions. Jack Hawley commented on the later textualizations of the devotional poetry attributed to Surdas. What we have in the Sur Sagar is not the monumental work of a single poet, but a sprawling, gradually evolving tradition that undoubtedly includes poems composed by several authors. Yet each of these poems bears a single poet's name. Prithvi Chandra Shobhi wrote similarly about the Vachanas. We may have to alter our notion of authorship in the context of the Vachanas. When I name a Vachana Kara, a Vachana composer here, I do not mean to indicate only the 12th century historical Vachana Kara, but a complex author whose compositions may have been created by many authors, but attributed to a historical figure. If we recognize that the Vachanas as we have today bear the imprint, the imprint of a complicated past that started in the 15th century. What can be said about them in the periods preceding it, preceding to it? I shall address this question in the remainder of my talk by searching for traces of vachanas in a text that was written in the early 13th century, which is the earliest collection of narratives about the 12th century vachana composers. And this is, of course, Harihara. The geographical collection I am referring to is commonly called Shiva Sharanara Ragalegalu, and it was composed in pre Vijayanagara Hampi by an accomplished poet called Harihara. As you can see in this slide, this text marks the beginning of a prolific and ongoing production of narratives about the 12th century Vachana composers and their associates in Kannada, Telugu, and later in other languages as well. The Ragalegalu contains dozens of saint stories, some of which are from Tamil, Tamil Nadu, some, of, uh, some from the Canada speaking region and some from other regions. The diversity attests to Harihara's broad understanding of this devotional culture. <coughs> the fact that the Ragalegalu was the first written account of the Canada saints explains its high ranking in the list of textual sources about these figures. And considering Harihara's careful crafting of narratives in the Ragalegalu, one might expect to find a profusion of detail about the Vachanas and the contexts in which, in which they were created. Against these expectations, the Ragalegalu does not say much about the Vachanas. And in this sense, the text further complicates our historical understanding of them. In my book, Shiva's Saints, I have argued that the Kannada devotional culture as presented in the Ragalegalu differs from the way it is depicted in later accounts. I have pointed out the fact that key terms that today are identified with this tradition, such as Anubhava Mantapa, Vira Shaiva, and Lingayat, 
as well as the word vachana itself are completely absent from the Regalegal. To describe the way in which devotees <clears throat> express their devotional sentiments, Harihara uses the general term gite, song, and not vachana. It is very possible that these songs include what we call today vachanas, but they are not distinguished in this corpus from devotional songs from other traditions, such as the Tamil. Moreover, songs occupy only a minute space in the saints' lives as the Ragalegalu depicts them. Most of the saintly figures in this text, including those whose vachanas came to be well known, are mostly appreciated for their devotional exploits and not for composing poetry. Above all else, the Ragalegalu stories about the saints celebrate their unwavering devotion to the god Shiva. This devotional commitment is expressed in myriad forms, of which the most apparent is the saint's impassioned worship of the god. Oftentimes, the saints in the Ragalegalu worship Shiva at the temple, an arena that is depicted in this text in positive terms and not criticized in the manner we saw earlier with Basavana's Vachana. Uh, the rich will build temples, what shall I, a poor man, do? In addition, the saints are remembered in this text for exceptional acts and miracle working, and these mostly take place in the context of public competitions with agents of other religions or in times of social crisis. Another recurring feature of the saints' life stories in the Ragalegalu is their support of the local community of devotees by doing things such as providing them with money, clothes, and food, as well as organizing collective worship events. When we examine the passages in which Harihara does refer to the saints' devotional singing, we find that he only rarely pays attention to the content or the unique mode of expression of the songs. In most cases, Harihara mentions devotional songs as a stock component of a familiar set of Shaiva ritual grammar, which involves worship of the Shiva Linga with food offerings, waving of lamp, lighting of incense, smearing of sacred ash, as well as singing devotional songs. These descriptions reveal very little about the song's content and carry very little of the radical messages found in some Vachanas today. Alama, among the most prolific and prized composers of Vachanas is not recognized as such in Harihara's version of his life story in the Ragalegalu. Harihara does not say much about Alama's Vachanas or his dramatic encounters with other spiritual figures, both of which are the hallmarks of his later biographies. Actually, Harihara's portrayal of Alama as a saint focuses on his wandering as a reclusive mendicant who shuns the company of humans and rarely speaks. <coughs> in the Ragalegalu Raga story about Alama, there is only one recounting of a poetic utterance by this saint. Consisting of words of praise for Alama's guru, it hardly re resembles a vachana in the sense of what we have earlier seen. And Alama here praises the yogi, uh, which is Animisha, the, uh, his yogi, actually his guru. The accomplished yogi of Shiva, Enjoyer of liberation's wealth. O Lord, great yogi, pure, eternal, and unparalleled. O Lord, a yogi of Shiva who generates pure, innate bliss. A firm yogi dedicated to holding Shiva in his hand. And this, is, this continues. This is the only lyrical quotation from Alama in the Ragalegalu. All of Alama's other verbal communications are terse, and mostly informational. 
When other characters express their wonderment of Alama, their appreciation focuses on his renunciation, on his practice of carrying the linga in the palm of his hand and on his spiritual qualities with no mention of his poetic acumen or verbal skills. <clears throat> with regard to Basavana, the story about him stands out in the collection as the longest and most developed. The extant form of this ragale contains only half of the original, but it still provides a detailed account of the early public memory of Basavana and contains copious details about his life story. While he does mention a few of Basavana's own songs, the space allotted by Harihara to this aspect of his life is limited. In Basavana's story, they are found in just one passage, counting 20 lines, out of a total of about 1,200 lines of the whole story about Basavana. In this 20 lines passage, Harihara reports that Basavana composed original songs when he was inspired by the collective worship of the God and the company of fellow Shaivas. The songs he composed were devotional in nature and focused on Shiva in his specific manifestation as Sangha. They affirmed the saintly community, voiced resistance to other religious traditions, and had an ecstatic quality to them. We also learned that Basavana's songs were disseminated widely and possibly were set to musical tunes. It is difficult to overestimate the significance of this passage because it confirms in Harihara's times the existence of a new poetry associated with Basavana, or at least the idea that Basavana composed new devotional poetry that circulated widely. But what was the nature of this poetry and what was its flavor? In what style was it composed? And what messages did it convey? The answers to these questions cannot be found in this passage. There is an additional episode in Basavanna's life story in the Ragalegalu that relates to one of his songs. The episode is one of several that describes encounters Basavanna had with other devotees, fellow devotees. This particular incident found in chapter 12 of the work has to do with a Shaiva devotee who lives in Kalinga, a region identified today as Orissa. The devotee regularly visits the Shiva temple and attends assemblies of worship and recitations, or Shiva Goshtis. One day, during one of these assemblies, assemblies, the devotee hears a line from a song attributed to Basavana. And I'm quoting here from the Basaveshvara Devara Ragale. If um, I can read it, it's very short. Berira berira sharange, nida dirdare, tare dandakudala sangama avadhar. If I fail to provide a saint with whatever he may ask, cut off my head, O Kudala Sangha, without hesitation. Hearing this song, <clears throat> right here. hearing this song, with Basavana's rhetorical offer of a blank check, the devotee, who is a merchant, schemes to get gold from him. The devotee arrives at Basavana's house with 30 empty carts, hoping to fill them with gold. But after Basavana graciously welcomes him, the devotee is incapable of following his original wish and instead of gold, asks for food. Without hesitating, Basavana says to him, no, Ask me for what you wished for earlier. And right then and there, Shiva showers from the sky gold, pearls, and rubies that fill the devotee's cart, who returns to his home happy. happy. In this way, Basavana indeed fulfilled his vow in the line quoted by Harihara. <coughs> I should have gone. Okay. I'm sorry, just I'm clicking the wrong buttons here. Yeah, so this is the Vachan. I'm sorry, I kind of flipped to the wrong one. Um, okay, the line in the song accords with what we think of in terms of Vachana, both syntactically and semantically. In terms of syntax, 
the quotation which addresses the God intimately, as many vachanas do, culminates with the familiar signature line or ankita of Basavana, which is the name of his chosen deity, Kurdala Sangha. Semantically, this quote presents a dramatic, indeed life-threatening commitment by the devotee to give up his life if he fails to satisfy the wishes of Shaiva supplicants. But what most strongly indicates that this is a direct quotation, perhaps the earliest available to us of a Vachana by Vasavana, is that the line is practically identical to a line from Vachana number 1053 in the complete Vachana collection published by the state of Karnataka. The full Vachana says, with no one to ask me for an elephant, a storehouse, or a stable of horses, I have become poor, O oh Lord. What will you ask of me, my God? Earlier you asked for the wife of Sindhu Balala, and, you ask, and if you ask for mine, I will tie a knot around her ankle. If I fail to provide the saints with whatever they may ask, cut off my head, O oh Kudala Sangama Deva. A word-by-word -word comparison of Harihara's quotation and the modern published version of this vachana with the textual variations marked in red reveals that the differences between the two versions in this case are negligible. But Harihara's framing of this vachana is significant. In Harihara's text, this song, Gite, of Basavana is a part of a broader repertoire composed by the elders, Puratana a term that usually refers to a larger cohort of model devotees, including the Tamil Nayanars. The fact that Basavana's quotation is associated with a large cohort of South Indian Shaiva saints might suggest Basavana's songs were not distinguished as uniquely regional. Moving now to the third saintly figure introduced at the beginning of this talk, Akka Mahadevi, we find that Harihara's treatment of her is similar to his treatment of Basavana. In Harihara's account of Mahadevi's life story, songs take up only a small amount of space in comparison with the attention paid to the tragic circumstances of her first forced marriage to a non-believer and her ardent worship of her beloved God. Further, the descriptions of Mahadevi singing to the God convey the author's appreciation of her devotional sentiment, but we learn very little from them about the content or quality of the songs other than the devotional intensity with which Mahadevi composes them. However, in chapter six, Harihara does quote Mahadevi singing. Alas, O oh Shiva, is there any love left out there to accept me? And could any room be left for devotion in marital life and away from you? O oh Shiva, what shall be my fate? What more can I say beyond these humiliating words? This song is almost identical to Vachana number 88 in the complete Vachana collection published by the state of Karnataka with two noticeable differences. The first is the changes in the register of the language. Forms of Old and Middle Kannada were updated in the modern publication to modern Kannada, such as from Per Ven, we see that here uh, towards the end, right here, Per Ven to Herluven, which is the more familiar modern future form. The second difference between the two versions is that in Harihara's version from the 13th century, the god is addressed emphatically as Shiva, Shivane, right here in purple. Whereas the modern rendition has the title Chenamali Karjuna here, who is the presiding deity in Trishailam and also Mahadevi's chosen form of Shiva. This change could be explained as the wish of later editors of this Vachana to connect it to Mahadevi 
by standardizing the signature line. In other words, that all her vachanas will end with Chena Malikarjuna as a kind of a sign of authenticity of the poem. <clears throat> In conclusion, <clears throat> I wish to return to the starting point of this talk and based on that, make a few general observations about devotional poetry in historical perspective. We started with the narrative of the Vajana composers and its active role in contemporary social and political debates in Karnataka. The modern discourse about the Vajanas revolves around the 12th century fellowship of Shaiva devotees, but also makes use of Vajanas as historical support for contemporary agenda. We have seen that the practice of redescribing Vajanas is not new, but recurring, and that the memory of the Vajana composers and the Vajanas underwent heavy rewriting during the 15th and 16th centuries in accordance with the changing socio-political circumstances of the Vijayanagara, Vijayanagara Empire. We again turned back in time in search uh, of textual evidence for Vajanas before the 15th century. I focused on Hariharas Ragaregalo, an important work from the early 13th century, which was the first to capture in writing the memory of the Vajana composers and their associates. In the Ragalegalu, we saw that poetic expressions of devotional sentiments are called songs, Gitegalu, and that the word Vajana, like other key terms of the later tradition, does not appear in this text. There is one uh, place where it appears, but it relates to not specifically to songs, but just utterances. But even this kind of singular appearance of the word vachana, I think is an indication that vachana is not a real term in this text. We do not know much about the songs, the Gita Galu Harihara refers to, but his stock use of these terms together with the elders or Puratanas suggest a devotional culture, specifically performative, that spread beyond the Canada region and included other regions of South India. Examination of three canonical figures, Alama, Basavana, and Mahadevi in the Ragalegalu complicates our inherited notions regarding their poetic oeuvre. While in later periods, Alama was foremostly understood as the paragon of the poet saint in this tradition and is credited with thousands of outstanding vachanas, in the Ragalegalu, there is only one mention of him, of his having composed a song. This, I think, should not necessarily imply that Alama did not compose Vachanas, but rather that his significance as a saintly person was more connected with his traits as an exemplar of renunciation and not with his utterances. In the stories about Basavanna and Mahadevi, we find that Harihara does acknowledge and recognize the significance of their devotional poetry, although again, this happens in a limited fashion. It is difficult to determine whether the meager attention Harihara pays to Basavanna's and Mahadevi's vachanas compared to their actual life stories is a sign of the vachanas marginality in Harihara's milieu or of their taken for granted popularity. But in either cases, it is possible to conclude that the treatment of the vachanas and songs in the Ragalegalu lacks the passionate and at times radical nature it assumed in later periods. Therefore, we could say that while the absence of the term vachana does not necessarily suggest the absence of vachanas in this period, it does, not, it does indicate the absence of the idea of vachana as a distinct genre in Canada. Support for Harihara's indifference to regionality and language is found in the story about the devotee who hears Basavanna's song in a temple performance in Orissa. It appears that songs of the 12th century devotees were considered by Harihara to be a part of a larger pool of oral devotional singing in multiple languages and settings that possibly also included the Tamil hymns of the Tevaram. 
Apart from Basavana and Mahadevi, no other saintly character in Harihara's collection is credited with composing Vachana. In comparison, lists of the 12th century Vachana composers in ever-growing collections of Vachanas today count hundreds of figures. The dramatic difference between Harihara's minimal attention to the songs versus their centrality and ubiquitousness in the later periods opens the possibility of an oral culture that flourished at the geographic and cultural margins of Hampi, where Hari Harihara composed his works, a culture that won institutional appreciation only centuries later. Alternatively, the devotional songs might have been present in Harihara's close environment, but were not considered important or unique. Instead, they blended in a broader devotional culture and only later started to signify the uniqueness of the Kannada tradition. In my future work on this project, I wish to examine seminal texts from shortly after Harihara, through the Vijayanagara period and up to modernity and explore the reframing of the Vajanas and shifting discourses about them over time. In addition, I wish to consider epigraphical evidence of Vajanas, which might provide clearer dating and reveal political ties and affiliations with network of religious institutions. I tentatively call this project a history of speaking. In recent works by Jack Holly, Christian Novetsky, the late Ammonius, Harshitam Vitinti Kamat, and many others, one finds a scholarly wish to break away from a limited understanding of devotional literature as strictly transcendent and to recognize the broader social and cultural sphere in which it participated. This growing scholarly interest in the historical context of religious traditions in South Asia necessarily implies developing new strategies for reading religious texts in their social and historical context, as I hope to have demonstrated today. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Gil. Uh, we are taking questions now. First question uh, from Dr. S. K. Aruni. Uh, what kind of sources were available to poet Harihara in the 13th century to study Sharana's history and their work? Yeah, uh, wonderful question. <clears throat> really wonderful question because it's, it really asked, how do we know? How did he know what he described? Um, first of all, he doesn't tell us. So we don't, I cannot really answer this question directly. Um, the, the, some scholars assumed uh, that Harihara even met Vasava. Basavana, even with like, that there is an indication that maybe Basavana visited Hampi and the difference, in, we don't know. Uh, it's very reasonable to assume that he heard oral stories uh, going around, maybe Vachanath, maybe other, I, I don't think there is anything written because nothing appears before Harihara. We don't have any indication to anything about the Sharanas before uh, Harihara's text. So my own opinion is that he heard this oral culture at, at temples. He heard talks about these amazing figures and this new culture of bhakti coming. Um, but maybe behind what you're asking me, there is another question, um, which is which is it's a deeper question of uh, how do we know that Hari Hada, what Hari Hada wrote was was correct, right? That he didn't invent off his mind, the whole story. And to me, the answer is that we don't, we don't know. We don't know, and I write it in the book, we cannot privilege Hari Hala's words as reality. We cannot think that what he says that happened, we, we cannot Im immediately assume. We can say it's reasonable, some of it reasonable, some of it not as reasonable. We can compare different sources and talk about what we find is reasonable, but there is no real way, I think, to present Harihara as the truth. However, what we can do with Harihara is to read Harihara's opinions, to read Harihara's approach to the Sharanas as indication of Harihara. 
even if what he says about Akka Mahadevi is incorrect, why did he say that? What did it mean about him that he said these things? So this is how I approach this question. I hope I answer what you're, you're asking. Um, uh, Professor Vijay Borati want to ask the question orally. Please, Vijay, unmute yourself and ask question. Uh, Gil, uh, after a long time I am seeing you, and uh, it was a lucid and good presentation, but I was expecting more from you, especially uh, uh, if we read the introduction to your book, uh, she, uh, she was devotees. Uh, I would like to ask uh, a question uh, about what you do in the introduction. Uh, like uh, in uh, page number 20 of your introduction to Shiva Saints, mm -hmm. you uh, mention about uh, one of the salient uh, features of Ariara's regulars, like that he talks about social interaction in Ariara, in Ariara's regulagado especially among the fellow Shaiva devotees. I mean, you, you open that uh, so, social interaction as depicted by Hariyara in his uh, composition is fraught with uh, differences, contradictions, and uh, incongruity. I mean, you're trying to bring out uh, diversity in terms of devotional expressions in the composition. So I would like to know, I mean, you do a very textual study of uh, uh, Hari Hariyara's uh, uh, composition. I mean, Hariyara's regalegalu. I am, I am, I am out of curiosity. I am trying, I am trying to uh, ask you. Uh, I am also interested to know what were the historical uh, compulsions on uh, Hariyara to bring out or exhibit the above uh, contradictions or uh, uh, incongruity. I mean, uh, what does the poet want to convey through such elements? I mean, is it to bring uh, harmony and coherence to devotion of uh, Shiva? Uh, uh, do we find such diverse intra-text elements in the preceding compositions, especially uh, Tamil devotional literature? Mm. If yes, is Arihara following the Tamil devotional uh, literary tradition? Uh, 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 these are some of the questions that I have in my mind. If you can uh, throw light on these questions, it would be nice. And also, I was expecting uh, more, uh, especially your critique of Sheldon Pollock, which you make in your introduction, but that's quite absent. It would have been very insightful if you had uh, 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 you know, uh, talked about your critique of Sheldon Pollock, which, are, which is very interesting, actually. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you, Vijay. Uh, great to hear you again. And uh, I mean, <clears throat> there, I have to say, you know, you, you, you pick a topic of a, for a presentation and, um, and, and, and that is your focus. And indeed, this, this culture is so vast and so rich. So there are plenty of topics we can discuss. I will, I will answer your question directly about this kind of social diversity and friction that Harihara describes, um, but I can refer everyone to the book. I mean, uh, it's kind of, you know, self-promotion. It won't make me a millionaire, I have to say, you know, if all of you buy the books, but this book is available in Oxford, by Oxford India print. So, and the price is reasonable and you can find it on Amazon IN. So uh, many things that, that Vijay, my friend touched upon now are found and discussed in detail in the book. Uh, and yes, today I was really talking more about my future project about the Vachan. Okay, now going to the to the specific questions that you're asked, you are asking, uh, what is Harihara doing, right? What Vijay related to was this section in my book that presents stories where Shaiva devotees do not get along with each other. They do not get along. I mean, <laughs> We try to think about, you know, what is, a, how do we imagine a, a, a Vira Shaiva devotee? What is a Shara? How does he live or she? <coughs> For example, does he worship Shiva uh, in the temple? Yes, according to Harihara, many times. For Harihara, the temple is a very positive arena. 
nothing of the criticism about temple. Can you worship the linga, the 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 the, the Ishta linga? Yes, you can worship Shiva holding in your hand a small Ishta linga. Can you worship Linga in your heart? Yes. And it happens, all these things happen in the Ragalagalu. In other words, Harihara is not invested in the, is not invested in telling us one way to worship Shiva, one way to live as a Bhakti community. That I think is not his interest. On the contrary, he is trying to present the Shaivism or Vira Shaivism or this Kannada Bhakti is something that each one can take to their own uh, to their own lifestyle and adopt in any way that he can. Uh, the most uh, strongest example is the meeting between a Brahmin and a hunter, right? And when they meet, the hunter and the Brahmin, the hunter serves meat as prasada, which is natural for the hunter, but the Brahmin cannot consume that. And Shiva interferes and transforms the meat into vegetarian dishes. But you can see that there is friction. There is friction. In Harihara's world, um, there is no one model for being a, a bhakta. The most important is your sentiment, your sentiment of love towards Shiva. And that is what is matter. It doesn't matter how you show it outside or it's not as important, we can say. And Vijay, I think you also asked me if other texts are similar and I think they're, they're not very different. I think if we read the stories, we can see in the Shunya Sampadane and in the Vasava Puranamu and in other texts, Many times Shaiva's devotees do not agree with each other, like today. That's the that's my answer in short. Uh, I see here a lot of, yes, uh, uh, Pradeep, maybe you can I see here uh, a professor. lot of also on the chat. So it's interesting yeah. to read. I can read out uh, Professor Rajendra Channi. Uh, he was earlier professor in Kuwempe University, English department. Uh, I am, uh, yeah, his question is, I am sorry, but I am disappointed. I read your book, Shiva's Science, very carefully and was hoping that you would non some of the unsubstantiated arguments. The problem with you and many others is the uh, belief that the vachanas were reconstructed or actually rewritten during the period of consolidation under the regime of Prouda Devaraya of the late Vijayanagara period. If you are so sure, why talk about Vachanas at all? Secondly, why do you prioritize Harihara who wrote Girija Kalyana, in which every part of a pregnant women's body is described in the conventional mode? Why do you treat Harihara as an authentic historian contrary, contrary to your skepticism that the Vachanakara movement happened at all? Okay, um, so there are several things here that I want to relate to um, in this response. First of all, um, I, I'm far from being skeptic about the Vachanas. I think that to some people make arguments there was no Vachanas. I think that to, to claim that is unreasonable. I think that the appearance of Basavana and the appearance of vachanas is undisputed. And it's fortunate to the culture. I think that their appearance is so, has made such an immense impression on history that it would be ridiculous to think that all this was fabricated, invented after the fact. So I think you misunderstood me. I don't think you really understand what I'm trying to say. If you are writing that I treat Harihara is an authentic historian after I just told Vijay that this is not history. I just said it very clearly, sir. Harihara is not history. Harihara can write whatever he wants. I don't know the history. Maybe you have a way of knowing history. 
Maybe you are very, very certain about your understanding of history. I respect that. I can only tell you what proof is, okay? So first of all, I don't at all uh, question the Vachanas. I think the Vachanas are very important and they were there right from the very moment that of the 12th century. I don't think that what Harihara describes is history, not at all. I think on the contrary, we have to be very suspicious when we read Harihara in order to understand what he's trying to say. <clears throat> I'm going back to the text that you said to see if there is another point. Um, secondly, why, oh, do why you... talk about, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Why do you yeah. prioritize Harihara who wrote Kirija Kalyana in which every part of uh, pregnant, pregnant women's body is described in the conventional mode? I, do, I don't understand the question. Can you rephrase that question? What, what, what is the question uh, here? Uh, secondly, why do you prioritize Harihara who wrote Girija Kalyana in which every part of a pregnant women's body is described in the conventional mode? So what is the, I don't understand what he's asking. I'm sorry. He's okay. asking what, what is the problem with is Girija? What yeah. is the description of pregnant woman? What does it, I don't understand what he's asking. I'm sorry. One second. If you would like to intervene, then I ask uh, Professor Rajinder Chenni to unmute please. himself and uh, please, yeah. uh, Professor, please intervene and uh, clarify yeah. uh, the question. Professor Chenni, sir. Just unmute. Hello. 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 Am I audible? Yes, sir. You are yes. audible. Please proceed with the question, please. The point I want to make is that there is a certain kind of a dichotomy in the writings of Rihara. I mean, um, I don't want to go into all the complexities of the literary and the cultural and the aesthetic traditions of the time, which probably compelled po poets to write in different kinds of modes of writing. Um, I mean, one could naturally go into what could be the pan-Indian Sanskrit uh, aesthetic model and the uh, counter uh, model which Harihara is supposed to have, you know, uh, initiated because I don't know, but this is exactly more or less the way in which we look at uh, Harihara because after a long tradition of the Sanskrit uh, Champu model and then the model of the uh, retelling of the epic uh, stories by Pampa and others, um, we are told that here is a rebel poet and uh, a poet uh, who wants to be, who, who proves to be extraordinarily original uh, in terms of the aesthetics and the poetics and the use of uh, language and form and meter, etc. But my problem is, uh, I mean, you have not said that, but I'm only questioning one of the problems associated with this. I feel that there's a dichotomy in the writings of uh, Harihara because um, why I mentioned uh, uh, the uh, detailed descriptions of uh, what happens to a woman's body during the pregnancy is not a silly question. My question is, my no, problem is, my, my problem is that this is a, is a, it's an, uh, it's a mindless repetition of uh, what has been a part of uh, the so-called pan-Indian Sanskritic tradition, where, you know, um, if even in Pampa of the 10th century, the father himself uh, describes uh, the appearance and the body of the daughter exactly in the same terms. You see? Now, these are questions which are not being resolved. I'm, I'm only trying to draw your attention to that. That is one question. Okay, all right. Therefore, I would take a very cautious and a very critical view of uh, Harihara uh, that uh, in the sense, um, you, I'm not accusing you or anything of that kind. I only felt that the emphasis in your writing was on treating Harihara's regalese uh, 
uh, as uh, evidence for contesting certain historical or received opinions about what happened during that period. You know, your major argument in your excellent book is that we need to ask questions about um, how did this sectarianism perform during that period at all? Did it affect everybody? You know, you were asking those questions in your uh, important book I have enjoyed reading. Now, my, my only problem is that uh, there are a number of very important scholars in Kannada tradition uh, who feel that Harihara should be seen as probably a uh, despite his aesthetic and linguistic experimentation, he should be seen as a continuation of what was there in the past, you know. And I don't, I, I'm, it's my, my own reading, my own subjective reading, that uh, he has very little understanding of the consciousness which is there in the Vachanakaras. Yeah, of yeah, course, yeah. I agree with you. I agree with you. You have clearly <coughs> said in your book, and I want to acknowledge that, you have clearly said that you are not trying in any way to say that uh, this is a counter-narrative and therefore you want to valorize it and all that. I agree with you. That's a very sensible thing to do. But somewhere I feel, I mean, I may be wrong. I hope I am wrong <laughs> because you are an excellent writer. Um, I hope I am wrong. But my my only problem with the whole construction is we need to be clear about it. You know, we have, I agree with you, um, no inscriptional evidences for what happened during the Kalyana period. I don't, I don't believe even um, M.M. Kalburgi was able to substantiate what happened during that period. So all that we depend upon is the uh, texts that we have, the Vachanakaras, and I have said in many of my articles that this is a circular argument that you reconstruct the period through the Vachanaka, Vachanas, and then you continue your argument without any substantiation, substantiation yeah. from the um, uh, reading of the inscriptions. Now, there are only two available choices for us. One is to say that nothing happened during that period. Okay, nothing happened that during that period because we don't have very uh, substantial, historically authentic accounts of that. That's one position that we can take, and that would lead us to the uh, to the uh, discourse that um, okay, maybe something uh, very unimportant happened, and then this was consolidated later during the period of the Pravdal Devara, uh, Devaraya period because um, the scattered Lingayas and all those who artisans were converted to uh, Lingayatism, they wanted something very, some, they wanted a history, they wanted a to construct a history, and that began with the Shuni Sampadanis, and um, uh, uh, and maybe there are many question marks that we want to have, okay? That's one of the things to do. The second thing is to, my question is, if that is so, if during the, but during the, the I, sorry, you, sorry, wait, wait, one, one minute, last minute, last, last, last one wait, question wait, only. Is, so I can reply. No, only, only the last uh, two statements I want to make is, if that, if someone were to believe that, uh, these were redrafted, rewritten, uh, or reformulated the vachanas during the later period. Why are there so many things which would have certainly embarrassed the Lingayat tradition? Why are there so many things which are so abrasive? Why are there so many things which are absolutely embracing? And they do not in any way support the idea of consolidation of the hegemony of the Lingayas. Why were they retained? This is my simple question. No, Sorry, I took a lot of, I, I apologize. I took a lot of time. I thought mm -hmm. maybe I was not very clear at the beginning. Yeah, no, no. But you did clarify some points and it's, uh, it's very good to kind of, you know, have this conversation that I can... Uh, better understand what you're saying and try to better present the way I see things. 
And um, so, <clears throat> again, I think that between saying nothing happened in the 12th century and between reading the Vachanas is concrete history. I think there is a lot in, the, in between. And this is where I'm working. And it's a gray area. And sometimes we have to work in a gray area. We have no other choice because we don't have epigraphical evidence from the 12th century on the one hand. And on the other hand, if you are going to read every Vachana as real and literal, as authentic, you will come to a very confusing picture. Some Vachanas contradict each other. Some are different. Some are multiversions. How do you, how do you, how do you decide which Vachana is the authentic one and which not? And it's a good question, actually. I'm not asking it just rhetorically. What are the ways of privileging? In fact, in the communities today, and it's an important thing to say, and you're, you're helping me, you're reminding me, and it's an important point. People are free to believe their own Basavana, their own Allama Prabhu, their own Vachanas. They carry them in their heart today. This is the heart of the tradition, living today in the bodies and mind of people. And I am not trying to pick and choose among these people. This is a lived tradition and it has its own power. What I'm trying to do is do something completely different, something much more minimal. I'm trying to say in this vast culture, when we place the evidence one next to the other, what can we see? I'm coming from a very different perspective. And I think the Vachanas were there. I think they were immensely influential. But I also think that to take a specific Vachana from a book printed today and to read it and say, uh, if, 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 if this is what inspires you to think what Basavana said, that's fine. But to reconstruct the history of Kalyana 12th century according to this Vachana or that Vachana is very, very, uh, uh, it's just unreliable. Now, am I doing the same with Harihara? No. For example, when Harihara writes, devotees went to worship Shiva in the temple, I am not saying, oh, they worship the temple. But I say that temples were important for Harihara. Temples were important for Harihara. Was Basavana himself important for Harihara? Basavana was very important for Harihara because this, the Ragale that he wrote about Basavana is the longest by far Ragale in all his Ragale writings. On the one hand, Harihara, we have this poet and that is a fact. We have this poet who appreciated Basavana and he also appreciated temples. And he wrote in the 13th century. Now, what do we do with that? You can do different interpretations. You are definitely uh, legitimately can say Harihara is unimportant. He didn't understand the right significance of the Vachanakara. You are, and people say that, Harihara missed the mark. But the fact that we have today the recollection and memory and the literary works by Harihara, the fact that Harihara was appreciated not only by his nephew Raghavanka, who is another important Kannada poet. He, he's, the works of Harihara were quoted in the anthology, Sukti Sudarnava, composed by a Jain at the court. Only decades later, a few decades after Harihara, his works, Giricha Kalyana, was quoted in an anthology of Canada. So he was renowned. He was an important Canada writer. And once we establish that, we need to listen to his opinion. We don't have to agree with it. We don't have to treat it as history, but we need to listen to it. That is my approach. Now to go, and I want to thank you again for talking about Giri Jakalyana and the writing of Harihara from a literary perspective or the perspective of the history of Canada literature, because and I, I, will, I will say about Sheldon Pollock that in this regard, he 
he did he did a huge service to the Canada Canada literature by seriously engaging with it and making it known and famous <coughs> in the world. It wasn't the reason why I I decided to learn Canada. What I the reason I decided to learn Canada was Ramanujan's translations of the Vajanas. That was my inspiration. But for many people. Sheldon Pollock's book, The Language of the Gods in the World of Men, was the main reason to focus on Canada studies, and that is a good thing, and we cannot take it from him. However, he stopped at a very important moment in history, the 12th century. He stopped once the Jain production, the courtly Mahaprabhandam starts to decline, and Shakpadi and those more, these are not exactly Deshi, genres, they're not exactly deshi, but they are less elitist in their in their style. They definitely are more simple to read, even though Raghavanka's uh, Harichandra Kavya is still a complicated work, I would say, but the meters are more simplified. The Ragalegalu is definitely easier to read than Giri Jakalyana. And you're right, from a literary perspective, Harihara was a complicated author. He could create Girija Kalyana as a Champu Kavya and also compose Ragalegalu, which are this weird literary genre. And I write about it in my book, but you, you know. Weird, taking a very simple meter, making it, he invented a genre which is relatively easy to understand. So we have the Ragalegalu, we have Girija Kalyana. Who is Haryada? Is Haryada a traditional poet or is he a follower of the Vajanakaras? I think he's both. I think Girija Kalyana deliberately participates in the traditional courtly culture of literature, deliberately. And by the way, I wouldn't say that uh, Girija Kalyana is a traditional work because even within those traditional boundaries and the you know, the descriptions of pregnancy or seasons or heroines, which are so inherited from Sanskrit. Even in that work of Girija Kalyana, I would argue, and I, I still didn't read it for thoroughly, but there are indications that I can see that Girija Kalyana is itself already an interesting work of transition, something that goes outside the regular conventions of Sanskrit uh, marga poetry, but he participates in that game. And he also participates in new things. He's attentive to the Vachanas. They influence him, this new culture. He wants to reach new audiences. He goes and composes the Rakalegal. So now what we make of it is a complicated creature. It's a complicated question. But from the, from the moment Hariyara uh, composes the Rakalegal, literature in Canada changes. And that's what I'm saying that Sheldon Pollock stopped short from reaching them, what I think is the most exciting moment where the Mahaprabhanda was a little bit, took the back step, unlike in Telugu. In Andhra Pradesh, it didn't happen. And in Telugu, Mahaprabhanda, the Sanskrit influence genre, continued to be the mainstream. There were Dvipada, there were other things, but in Canada happened something which is very rare. There was a real change in literary production from the Mahaprabhanda, from the Marga towards the Deshi, developing these new genres uh, like Shadpadi, like Raga Legalu, uh, and, and kind of, you know, the Gite, the, the all kind of uh, more oral forms that are become more and more central in the literary tradition of, of Canada. And that is fascinating to me. So it's a transition. So Harihara makes a transition. He changes in his works the way that people write poetry. From that moment on, everyone aligns. I mean, I'm saying it in a very dramatic way, but Raghavaka composes the first Shadpadi work. After that, Shadpadi becomes a standard. Writing Kannada literature changed forever. And that started with Harya. So of course it will be, there will be these dichotomies that as you describe them, which I, I'm not sure they're dichotomies. I think they're kind of a process or an ongoing transition, which reflect broader transitions in, in Kannada literature. I'll stop here to allow other people to ask more questions. But of course, Rajendra, Dr. Cheney, we can continue the conversation, which I enjoy and I appreciate. Hello. Uh, hello. Hello. Hello, sir. Please proceed. Oh, no, no, no. I, I appreciate that a very 
elaborate and long uh, 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 you know response given by ben um, okay you know uh, i don't have to tell you that we have disagreements and all that but uh, uh, on behalf of all uh, canada uh, readers and writers we want to thank you you know because there is so little about hari hara uh, in english translation and uh, mm, i am looking forward to the collaborative translation uh, please i hope it will come out very soon okay uh, mm. and of course of course our disagreements will continue and that's the thing apart you know i don't okay. want to interrupt the conversation please write me an email but please write me an email you can find my email. yeah 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 I I want to uh, end by saying I have read every word of Shiva's saints and I have enjoyed it and I have uh, benefited from it and uh, in one of my histories of Kannada literature uh, in one chapter I have discussed you in uh, detail uh, please uh, my request is continue to write no. about Ha as continue to write about us about our tradition thank you thank you so much with all gratitude and also my own critical problems thank you so much thank you professor chenni and uh, we are uh, taking another question from ns gundur he is associate, associate professor of english in uh, davangere university karnataka how did you hit upon the idea of working on this topic or problem yeah it was uh, it was this uh, the i thank you for this question because i think it was a kind of you know like a lot like a lot of fortunate events it was kind of a coincidental uh, but i was um, i was reading uh, in an old article about the kanta ramaya i mean the story about the kanta ramaya is very it's 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 right it's 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 huge it's huge there is violence there there is it's a lot of it touches on a lot of sensibilities of the karnataka society right the saint and he has a conflict with a jain and he cuts his own head and he puts it back and the temple is converted so there's a lot of juicy parts and i read an old ver- an old version of it and another version in basava purana when then i went to to my sort to study canada and one of my teachers a wonderful dr jyoti shankar what a wonderful person and she said yeah there is a version also by one hari hara and i was like who's hari hara when is he when did he write he said early 13th century said, wait a minute this is interesting and i read his version fact is hari hara's version of ekanta ramaya is different then palkuriki somanata's version in the basava purana no? which is different than the inscription the abaluru uh, inscription version three different versions very limited time span early 13th century all of them a historical event temple conversion with social implications that really drew me into this culture of storytelling and its relation to history because the story of akanta ramaya was just so amazing so interesting and i wrote an article that compares the three versions showing that we are like we we have to establish some ways of thinking about history we have to establish some critical ways to decide what we want to believe has happened and sometimes we have to say we don't know we can't know so that how i got into harihara but then to see the beauty of his poetry the sentiment of devotion along with the deplorable parts which are the violence against non shaivas there are some deplorable parts which i'm not ignoring and i'm 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 facing but the overall package of harihara is so fast it's so rich so well crafted that i kind of i was sucked into it and the, the topic emerged by itself it's a kind of a discovery of a new treasure a new literary treasure for people outside karnataka of course not for, no not for those who already knew harihara that is old news but for people outside karnataka a question from uh, bayre gowda uh, body and shiva are do you think uh, that body and shiva are one and the same after reciting the famous vachana like dehave degula kale kamba shirave hunna kalasave as most of the vachanas are kaya the body and kaya ka work center i i uh... Look, I mean, in Shaivism more broadly, 
we are Shiva. We are Shiva, I think. And 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 we forget it all the time. We always forget it. We need to be reminded constantly that the body, we, us, Atman, is Shiva. Now, in for me, Basavana's Vachana is another appeal to us, a reminder. You don't need to go out, it's already in here. And I think Harihara would accept that. I don't think Harihara is in argument about this. I think the more question is how do we get to feel our body? How do we get to feel Shiva in our body? So we are all human beings. We we shift different modes in our minds. Sometimes we cross to the other shore where we feel the bodies in Shiva. But I don't approach this question doctrinally. I don't say Basava was right, he was wrong. I, I think it's a much more experiential question. It's much more personal. It's about each one of us, how we feel at a given moment. That is how I approach Basavana's poetry. A question from S.P. Wageshwari. She is a professor in uh, social sciences in Christ University, Bangalore. An egalitarian movement later became regimented into a caste. Does this mean that regardless of philosophical core, all movements get subsumed by political considerations over time? Yeah, <laughs> it's a wonderful, I mean, you know, and, and, and Ramanujan puts out this question very, very nicely in his introduction. So he takes, <coughs> <coughs> sorry, he takes the Vachanas and this moment of Basavana and Allama and Akamarvi and all these great writers, he, he presents this moment as a moment of true egalitarianism, true liberation, social liberation. And then with time, cast, right? Like to make it long story short, we end up in a caste structure, which is discriminatory and hierarchical and in a way also corrupt, right? It's kind of unfair in some essential way. But my, I, I think it was a little bit different. I think it was a little bit different. I think that even in Basavana's time and in Hariyada's time, and I, I, I say it, I don't know history. It's, I don't know what happened really, but I see by the, the text, I think that reality was complicated from the beginning. I think that already in the 12th century, when Basavana made these beautiful bachanas, reality was already complicated. There was never a moment where everyone were, the problems are there. When you, when you read Harihara, you know, and okay, I'll say something else, but, but when you read Harihara, you take two good devotees, they both love Shiva, but one was raised vegetarian and one was raised hunting meat and they need to sit together and worship Shiva. What do they do? How do they do that? You need to approach one another without discrimination. A hunter is equal to a Brahmin. The only criteria is you love Shiva. But this egalitarianism happens in Haryada only within the Shaiva activity. Once you go out to the world, you are a wife, you are a husband, you are a merchant, you are a hunter, you are a Brahmin, you have an identity, you have a role. In those areas, I don't think there was egalitarianism ever. I mean, one indication for, for this argument, and again, we are talking about very vague issues. It's very difficult to determine these. But my sense is that if, all, if many Vachanakaras are recognized by their profession, right? Madiwala and Machaya and so on, there was no real freedom from your profession. Kaya kave kailasa. So go do your work. Don't seek other, other kind of, in other words, once we are in the social realm, we entering a complicated terrain. And I think that complicated terrain was there in the beginning. Yes, it was groundbreaking. It was egalitarian. It was revolutionary. And we need to draw inspiration from it. I'm not taking away all of those things. But when we use the word egalitarian, egalitarianism doesn't exist today in India. But it doesn't exist today in Europe. 
It doesn't exist today in the US. In fact, egalitarianism is an ideal. We can only try to get there. We'll never get there completely. So this is how I approach this. An ongoing battle, not so much as a development into a caste. Although obviously with time, Marta's 15th century, we know the Viraktas, the 700 villages, start institutions, interests, you want to kind of establish a, an order, you want to establish a, a legacy, you start to privilege some people as the priests and so on, you start to train only these people, you exclude others. Yeah, these processes are inevitable. But I don't think they're at the core of what we're talking about here. Uh, question from uh, SK Aruni. Uh, was it because the Basava Purana text found first by European scholars, hence Basavarna became central figure or Sharana of Lingayatism or Sharanas? <coughs> I'm not sure. Um, well, you're, so, I mean, Dr. Aruni is here, so you can... Uh, you're saying it was discovered before Harihara, in that sense, that because the Basava Purana, Basava Purana Mu, Basava Purana, the Kannada translation was found before Harihara? Can, can uh, sir, sir, my argument, hello. Yeah, I hear you, yeah, yeah. Uh, sir, my argument, you know, Basava Purana was encountered by the European Mackenzie time, Mackenzie, I mean, 18, before 1800. So that's why Europeans were aware of the, the Basava Purana and Basavarna. That's why I think the entire, you know, Vachana movement centralized Basava as a central figure because the more availability of the Basava Purana. Is it because of that, sir? I, uh, it's an interesting, again, I, I, I mean, if we try to think about the history, you know, we're trying to find like uh, detectives, you know, look for indications in history. What was the stator stator of of, of Basavana before that. Was he appreciated before that? And from what I'm seeing, he was. I mean, already again, the fact that we have a text called Basava Puranamu, named after Basava, already shows that in the early 15th century, when Palkuriki Samanata composed this text, he recognized the importance of Basavana. And I think the 15th century Vijayanagara Viraktas, when they composed the Shunya Sampadana and other texts, they tried to highlight Alama but they didn't play down Basavana either. I mean, that would be foolish to say because he's, he's also present there next to Alama. So there is also that. And then in the 18th century, something very interesting happened. You, we get all these, uh, well, Mackenzie, you know, and the political, but we get the religious, you know, the, the, the kind of Protestant and the missionaries from Europe who come and when they encounter Vera Shaivism or the memory of Basavanana, they immediately see some points of similarities with their understanding of Protestantism, Protestant Christianity, and they obviously highlight those aspects. And from that moment onward, the modern reconfiguration of Vera Shaivism works very well along the lines of Protestantism, even to the extent of uh, Ike Ramanujan's book this belief in the personal faith, this rejection of the temple ritual, this stress on work ethics, kaya kave, the work ethic, all these things are so familiar from Protestantism. So it was easy to call Vira Shaivism the, you know, the, the, Prost the Protestant religion of India, right? And it's, especially if you come biased against idol worship, right? That kind of label, which is derogatory, if you are against this, this, this mainstream temple Hinduism, which is ritually focused, oh, you found your uh, native indigenous religion that is better aligned with what you are, you meaning the Europeans uh, bring to the table. And uh, I mean, it, it's effective as any, maybe as any kind of an introduction to the religion. I think that once you delve deeper you know, you tend to see the differences. It's a shame to be caught in these paradigms, comparative paradigms. Many times you lose as much as you gain from this. But I want also to uh, refer you to this book, Telugu Resurgence, C.P. Brown, and uh, this is kind of a description of C.P. Brown's career in Telugu. And C.P. Brown was a, was a giant, but he also, 
dabbled or, or kind of played with this idea of Lingayatism as an alternative. And he was very much, his access to India was really bifurcated between Brahmins and Lingayats. And they started to argue on the heart of C.P. Brown. And he went through transition. So that could, that's a great book to go and read and see the resonances with this question. Uh, thank you, uh, Gil. Uh, yeah, we have uh, taken almost all questions. If anybody wants to comment or if anybody wants to intervene with question or opinion, uh, please uh, proceed uh, after unmuting yourself uh, and, and uh, please ask questions. If anybody wants to ask or intervene. Hello. Hello, may I? Yeah, uh, Professor S.P. Vagishwari. Yeah, you're audible. Professor S.P. Vagishwari has a question. Please proceed. Um, hello, Professor Gil. Thank you very much for the talk. Uh, I, I would like to just go ahead a little bit the egalitarian uh, part. Now, my dilemma is how would we term a movement to be egalitarian when it constantly um, constantly strives to bring about a monotheistic belief and augmenting that belief by, by, um, by bringing people into one core part and saying that belief in Shiva is what uh, provides the eligibility to be ca called as egalitarian. In the sense, uh, the movement did not open up itself. Rather, it, it brought people into one core argument of worship of Shiva. So by that yardstick, uh, how do we call that? How do we term it as egalitarian? Because there is always this, uh, this, this uh, juxtaposition of it being called as egalitarian vis-a-vis -vis that of the Brahmanical orthodoxy that prevailed. I want to thank you because you're, uh, you're, you're kind of, you know, you're shedding light on the outside the circle. Right, so we think about this this Vira Shaiva circle is, and I I I, I have to say I need I had to say I needed to say it before, when I use the term Vira Shaiva, I do it in a very fuzzy way, Vira Shaiva, Lingayatism, whatever we want to call it, but but we're talking about this Shiva Bhakti of Kannada regions, and it's very it's, it's many permutations. So this circle. Suppose everyone inside are egalitarian, which I also, I said before, I think only occurs at ritualistic moments. I think in the usual social interactions, I don't think it's there. But even if we call it egalitarian, that circle, once we step outside the circle, if you're a non-Shaiva, you're a Bhavi. And a Bhavi is deplorable. In other words, we see a lot of thorny attitudes from the tradition to non shaiva Can we call it egalitarianism? I would personally am more comfortable not using the term egalitarianism. It very it carries so much, so much. It's such a heavy term, such a laden term, that it's unuseful anymore. I think, but others can can think it is. But definitely, you find a lot of belligerent, aggressive sectarianism, communalism, in the stories of Harihara. That's a fact, it's there. I won't go into the details, check in the book. The terminology that he calls Jains, a little bit less to Vaishnavas, is terrible. Dehumanizing. Now, if I am a Keramanujan, and I want to present the beautiful universal aspect of this tradition, I won't choose those vachanas which are combative. There are such vachanas. I don't think there are many. Definitely in the stories, this aggressiveness is there. So some scholars try to say, well, Basavana is the good guy. Excuse my simplistic 
language. I don't mean to play down Basavana. Basavana is the good guy, and Ekantaramaya is a zealot, the bad guy who fights others. I don't make these, I, I think it's complicated. I think it's more complicated. I think once you create a certain identity and ideal, you are bound to reject others who don't subscribe to it. It's inevitable. So that's my short answer to you, Vagishwari. But it's a, we can call it a problem. We can call it a, something which is complicated with the tradition. And I agree, it kind of uh, complicates the egalitarian claims. That's, uh, I'm not saying anything new here. Thank you very much. OK. Uh, anybody wants to intervene? Otherwise, uh, uh, Professor Datatriya, Subhas Karmaya, or uh, if anybody wants to intervene, otherwise we wrap up the session. Uh, if you have a question, please unmute yourself and uh, introduce and uh, please ask. Otherwise, we wrap up. Okay, it seems, uh, you know, uh, the questions, and there were no questions and uh, we are wrapping up the session. Uh, thank you very much, Gil ben Herat, for making space and time uh, to deliver us and uh, uh, to you know, participate in a very beautiful uh, Q&A that is beautifully, you know, uh, you know witnessed and uh, I think very remarkably uh, it, it happened. Uh, after the session. Uh, so I personally and uh, collectively thank you on behalf of uh, Bengaluru Histori so Historian Society, especially uh, uh, for uh, SK Aruni, who is representing, and uh, on behalf of Itihasa Darpana, uh, HG Rajesh, who is representing, and also thanking you on behalf of uh, uh, Ruthumana.com, a cultural literary, you know, podium which is uh, exhibiting their interest in, you know, multi dimensions of uh, Karnataka and Karnataka culture. And uh, Mr. Nitish Kuntadi is uh, representing Ruthumana.com, and uh, and and I also expressing my gratitude and uh, you know, regards on behalf of the August audience who gathered here and uh, who effectively honestly engaged themselves in the in the in the conversation and q and a especially and uh, made the program fruitful and you know and also they represented the spirit of uh, discursive uh, dialogue and discursive academics especially which is very essential uh, for the contemporary time especially for karnataka uh, so again uh, once again i thank you uh, gil ben herath for making time and uh, I express my warm gratitude to you. Thank you very much. I wish to thank you, the organizers, all of you who made this happen, and especially the audience for such a interesting questions. It's a real pleasure to engage with my research with, 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 with you people. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you very much. And uh, there will be, uh, and I hope uh, that, uh, that there will be you know, physical appearance of Gilben Herat across Karnataka, especially in Bangalore or Mysore or somewhere. And I hope or we hope that you know, we hear you verbally and uh, you know, physically. Uh, see you soon. And uh, please audience note uh, uh, for next Saturday, uh, there will be a session by Ranjita Datta, Professor Ranjita Datta, Center, Center of Historical Studies. Jawaharlal Nehru University, New Delhi. Uh, she talks on Odyssey or an Exile, Examination of Ramanuja and Sri Visistha Dvaita sect in Karnataka region. So I also heartily welcome you people for that session and uh, uh, hoping, you know, hoping for a, uh, a good program and good sign of engagement uh, of ideas and, uh, you know, uh, thing. Uh, I wrap up this session and I Again, I thank, I express my sincere thanks to Gil Ben Harat and thank you very much. Good night for all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Gil.